It's a gospel on the radio talk show. A show about dreams and visions and a church that is indeed triumphant, alive, and well. For the church, triumphant is alive and well. Hello, Tallahassee. This is the Gospel on the Radio talk show. I'm Pastor Jack King. I am your host, and I'm just always excited. This is a fun time for me to be with you here on Sunday morning here on 94.1. On your radio dial, where we talk about dreams and visions and a church triumphant, alive and well. We talk about the church and all that God is doing in his glorious kingdom. Show number 1,159 today. And uh, we have a few rules. We don't talk sports, politics, or doctrine, but we do always speak well of one another. And uh, I have our good brother, Brother Sean Kane, back with this third time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness, he has such a story to tell. And uh, uh, we've, uh, if you've tuned in before and you've heard Sean before, we, you know, he's the one that took off to Uganda because God told him to, and he didn't have any. Uh, change of clothes or anything, no money, but God took care of him. And that launched a whole ministry. It's called uh, Evangelism Global. Sean, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's and great to be you, here. You just got back from Uganda. I did. How long ago? Because it had to be just a few days ago. Not right. quite a few days ago, but it's been uh, two, three weeks. Has it been long? Because mm-hmm. I know we were, I was texting with him because we talked about him coming back on the show and all of a sudden the texting stopped. <laughs> <And I> said, <laughs> Okay, he's, he's he's out of the country because I yeah. got another friend yeah. that goes to Africa, and the same thing happens with him. Yep. <laughs> so I, I, I knew that's what, where we were going. So, so you you went back to do some preaching or or what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went back to join our team there and do some some uh, team building things with them. Preached in a uh, gospel festival they were doing. Okay, in the slums. Yeah, because the, the thing that we have learned uh-huh. from just listening to your stories as you yeah. come to the show and told us about it, you through your experiences, you have contacted people, uh-huh. and uh, as you say, you your team, mm-hmm. and uh, how many is on your team over there? Uh, we have ten staff over ten East staff, <laughs> <laughs> and and what do they do? Oh, uh, individually or just. Well, as a team, in yeah. So in general, the, uh, as a team, um, they make disciples, but they, they really focus on trying to bring the gospel to parts of Africa where it hasn't reached. Oh. So they go into an area that's somewhat reached with the gospel, has some local churches, and they join with them to teach the locals how to share the gospel okay. in the villages and in the community. And then they mobilize a large outdoor event and gather as many non-Christians as possible to hear the gospel and so, so teaching has a lot to do with it. It's a bit to do with developing it for sure. and developing uh, uh, different methods of teaching and yep. materials and all this type of thing. And uh, is there is there a lot of technology in Africa now? Uh, more than used to be. Yeah. yeah, not as much as America. Yeah, because yeah. I remember when I was in Ghana, we had taken a bunch of notes with this and teaching stuff, and they, and they yeah. wanted it. I mean, yeah. and we didn't realize, we didn't think about that. They that they would want. This material, mm-hmm. and uh, so we took a break, and they came back, and they had found someplace with a mimeograph, <laughs> you know. But, but they had it; they they done it somehow. Yeah. Or another, they had all that that stuff, and they were just happy to to have it. But it certainly uh-huh. wasn't because this nineteen ninety three. We didn't even have computers really in sure. America at that time. But uh, it's like say we just thought, oh, uh, well, I used to have one here at church called a fluid duplicator. Where you crank it? <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, but like I say, they got it done. So, but, but you talk about you having a team. Mm-hmm. So they they traveled to other countries. That's the goal. So, so how did uh, it, I know transportation is a, a bit of an issue there? How did they travel? Uh, well, they we have one vehicle so far. Okay, uh, it's a van. Seats uh, seven or eight, I think. Okay. Uh, but outside of that, when they need to take a bigger team, they have to rent a truck for all of our equipment. Okay. Um, they call it a lorry, a large lorry. Right. Small semi, think of it that way. Or like a, I think like one of those 30 foot U Hauls, something like okay. that. Okay. Sure. Um, and then the rest of the team will usually rent a vehicle, uh, something similar to like a Volkswagen bus. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> but now, 
can they easily cross from one border to oh, another? Sure. From sure. one country to yeah. another? I mean, you have to have passports or anything like yeah, that? You have to have passports, but it's pretty simple to okay. cross from one to the other. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm picturing all this in my mind. I yeah. Mean, this team, because you say they go, mm-hmm. and then, of course, they're just trying to make contact with different churches and different mm-hmm. uh, Christian organizations, but then they hold an outdoor event. Yep. Now, what would that look like? Well, uh, I guess explaining how that comes about would probably i can hear you trying to fill in the gaps sure, sure yeah so they're based in uganda and what we do when we're trying to reach either a place in uganda or one of the surrounding countries or further is we'll send an expeditionary team meeting with the local pastors in an area we want to go okay um, once those connections are made we begin to send some of our team that goes uh can go up to a couple months ahead of us the rest of the team okay, okay. and they'll work with those local churches teaching some of the local believers how to go door to door, sharing the gospel one to one, um, really discipling them in being in the area of spreading the gospel. Okay. What they'll also do is they'll begin mobilizing some of the churches to begin praying, working together, fasting for hopefully doing some event that will draw in a large harvest at once. Okay. Um, so we're, it's twofold. We yeah. want to make disciples. We want to teach them how to do what we do. And at the same time, we don't want to wait for everyone to learn for people to be able to hear the gospel. Right. So the other thing that we usually do is we will, uh, the team there will come up with innovative ways, depending on the local culture where they're at, to mobilize non-Christians to want to come. So one thing that they did for one of the last events was they put on a county-wide soccer tournament. Wow. Or their football there. Right, right. Right. And so every village had their own team, and all of the villages began facing off against each other for a month, this tournament. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> countywide, every village is facing each other, yeah. and by the time it culminates, you'll have a large enough, thousands will come, really? because they're <laughs> there. They're one, they're hearing there's some type of gospel event, uh-huh. so some of them are Christians, they're coming for that. They're thinking revival, something. Right. Others are just thinking, there's something new coming, uh-huh. so we want to go. But others are there just because this is something new. We're uh-huh. having a tournament. This is fun. <laughs> it's our own miniature World Cup. Right. So all the locals come, huh. and what we'll like, we like to do is then present the prize to the first, second, and third place winners during the event. Huh. So that it draws all the everyone there. They hear the gospel, and then we present the it's prize. The thing about it is that... Um, in places like that, people will come out for stuff like that. Absolutely, it's it's a little bit harder here in America unless you got beer. If you got beer yeah. involved in, it, <laughs> then you'll get a crowd. I mean, I've yeah. I've just observed yeah. that. <laughs> well, you know, we are the entertainment capital of the world. So if we're competing with Florida State University to bring people to a football game, it's just right. It's right. probably not. Yeah, gonna you happen. probably want to plan your events uh, yeah. around something uh, like that. Uh, exactly. But 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 over there, the people will come to things like that, and it's a, it's an excitement as such. But now, the uh, place in Uganda, is it a lot of Christians, a lot of Muslim? And how does that work when you're, when you're doing some type of a Christian event? Or is, or is, is that cool? <laughs> as far as they are concerned, I'm talking about. You know, it depends on where you're, just like anywhere, depends yeah. on where you are. Parts of, parts of the country, parts of Africa, parts of Uganda are very much Christian. Other parts are very much not. Okay. Uh, the, Probably the two major influences, things that you, you face in Africa are um, paganism slash witchcraft yeah. and uh, Islam. Okay. But uh, but yes, it's there. There is pushback depending on where you are. Yeah, it can yeah, be very dangerous. In some countries, you, you just don't do this. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's just so uh, closed up. You just don't do it. If you do it, you're... You're on the sly <laughs> because your your life could be at risk. Correct. And uh, and I've had missionaries here on this show mm-hmm. that would not would not say where they were at. Absolutely. And they wouldn't give their names. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, but uh, so it sounds to me like it, the area that you're in is a little bit more open to some of the areas. Some of them I'm also I've also not mentioned on this okay. radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have to be careful about these things, but but there's parts of the world. But that's really what your objective is: is to carry the gospel. That's right. And, uh, and of course, that's one of the things about 
uh, radio and stuff like that. Radio doesn't have any boundaries. I Correct. mean, it'll it'll go right on across the country lines, and and uh, uh-huh. they can't stop it. That's right. There's no visa <laughs> yeah. required. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that one of the, uh, the stations that I'm on is like. And of course, it's it's on smartphone, and uh-huh. everybody everybody all over the world now has got uh, cell phones and stuff like that. Right. And uh, uh, it comes and I, I get emails from people of different. Country said, "Yeah, we're coming in loud and clear here." I said, "Well, good. Wow. <laughs> you know, we're just bringing the gospel." But the thing is, I said, "You are uh, seeing mm-hmm. the fruits of something that happened. How long ago was it that you took off and went to?" <laughs> that was the fall of 2014. 2014. So we're at uh, seven, eight, almost eight years now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just, <laughs> I know that uh, I mean, you've told the story here, but I'm just thinking there's people who are who have tuned in and they've heard me allude to this thing. They, they don't have any clue. So just bring us up to speed. Go back and tell the story a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll give the shorter version this okay. time. Since All right. We've given a longer right. version is that I uh, got saved. Uh, in fall of 2020, uh, 2012, okay. September 23rd, 2012. And not long after that, the Lord gave me a calling to ministry as my main focus mm-hmm. and told me, Sean, one day you're going to go to Africa and you're going to do these big events with lots of people hearing the gospel. I said, I have no idea what that is <laughs> or how to do it, but okay. And so two years later, uh, through a series of prayer, just reading the word and God speaking to me directly was I was told to sell my car, buy a one-way plane ticket, leaving Jacksonville, Florida at sundown in seven days. (laughs) Okay. Take no money, take no cell phone, take no extra luggage, no extra clothing, and there'll be a man waiting for you at the airport to pick you up. (laughs) And so that was my friend, Fred Mugamba. He's a pastor. The one I was telling you was uh, here in Tallahassee over the summer. Hopefully we'll be back on the show. Hopefully he'll be on the show. At some well, point. I'm, I'm expecting that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so a week later, there I was. I landed, and sure enough, there was Pastor Fred. I had never met him before. Total stranger, and he found me in the airport. Now come on, you got to tell the whole story. Okay, okay. Tell, okay so, tell, tell the whole thing there. So tell it. So telling the whole story. I landed, and honestly, I was so uh, I was praying so hard leaving from. I had a layover in Heathrow Airport, London. Coming from London to Uganda, okay, in Tebe, Uganda, it's the uh, airport. And on my way, I I met this African man who said he was a pastor, and I swore it was the Lord telling me this is the guy. And I just swore up and down that can't be the Lord because I heard that he's going to be there at the airport. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan! And sure enough, it was the Lord. So I landed in Entebbe. It's eleven or so at night. Uh, I'm seeing this man ahead of me in the immigration line, keeps looking back at me, keeps looking back at me. <laughs> and then I lost him at some point as I finally got my visa. I'm making my way out of the airport. It's packed full of people. It's coming. It's a week before Christmas, so a lot of people are coming home. Families are, hundreds of people are right outside the front doors. The moment I come out, I'm accosted by about seven cab drivers. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that experience. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Muzungu, Muzungu. Uh, that's uh, Swahili for right. a, a foreigner, a white right. man. Muzungu, Muzungu. Uh, oh, oh, come with me. Come with me. They're, 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 they're all jockeying for a position to take yeah. me. Oh, come, come with I remember one of them. Come, I, I will take you to the Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking. I, I have no money. Does he know I have no money. <laughs> no debit card either. And so... Uh, I just got away from those guys. I thought, oh, I've got to get a loan. I need to hear from Jesus because here I'm here now yeah. with no money right. and no return ticket. <laughs> no phone. No way to – there is no option. If right. God doesn't show up, I'm stuck in a foreign country with nowhere to go, nowhere to get back. <laughs> and so I said uh, – I went and sat down on these benches that incidentally are still there. I took a look. I took a peek the last time I was at the airport <laughs> in Uganda. I sat on these benches and I said, God, I'm here. You asked me to come here, I'm right, here. And right. I heard very matter-of-factly, stand up. Okay. I stood up. Okay. Yes, sir. I stood up. 
And when I stood up, I could see into the airport lobby over the heads of all the hundreds of people packed at the front. I could see in the lobby was empty except for one man. And it was Fred Mugamba walking around, looking around corners, looking around this, down this hallway. He's looking for someone. <laughs> right. And I realized that's him. Uh-huh. So I ran to the front and I lost him. Uh, to be honest, I lost him in the crowd, lost him in the crowd. And I thought, I don't trust myself to find this random man in a crowd full of people <laughs> right. in the dark. So I'm going to walk to the parking lot. Faith can't sit still. If you believe, belief produces action. So I've got to act. Right. Okay. I've got to move. If I really believe God has a ride for me, might as well make my way to the parking lot. <laughs> so I start walking and I say, I see this guard with an AK-47 and I thought, man, <laughs> <laughs> we're not in Kansas. Yeah, anymore. we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> yeah. This is a lot different than Heathrow Airport. And I said, God, I'm not worried, but I'd like to get this show on the road. Right. So uh I also don't trust myself to find this man in the crowd, but I trust you. Right. So I'm also the only white guy in this entire <laughs> airport. There is not a single other white man in the whole airport. So right. I it's easy to find me, <laughs> <Right>. you know. <laughs> I said, instead of me finding him, have him find me. Well, that was the plan all along. That's what God told you. That, that, That's that, correct. Right, right. That's correct. <laughs> as soon as I said, have him find me, I felt a firm grip on my left shoulder. Uh-huh. And this guy, <sighs> leaning into my face, <laughs> he was running up from behind me. <sighs> I have been looking for you everywhere. <laughs> Come with me. He went to his car. He put me in his car. We began to drive. He looked puzzled that I had no luggage. <laughs> we came to the gate. He's paying the guards to leave the gate. And I I said, I need to know your side. Why did you do that? Uh-huh. He said, I saw you in the airport. Uh-huh. And when I came to my car, I could not leave. I could not leave. And then Jesus spoke to me. And told me, go back and find the Muzung and bring him to your home. <laughs> and give him a place to live in Uganda. Uh, and? and? I did. <laughs> <laughs> His wife was so puzzled. I asked I saw him uh, a few months ago. I was, uh, me, I was back in Uganda hanging out with him, having lunch. And I said, what was your wife thinking? Right. Because the first night I walked in the door and you could see on her face, who is this strange? What? My husband just came back from America, and who's this white man at one or two in the morning by right. the time we arrived right. at his house, walking through the door? She was very shocked, puzzled, <laughs> but she didn't want to be rude, so right. she said nothing to me, but I could see it in her sure. face, her eyebrows. The expression said yeah. it all. Uh, Facial expressions cross language boundaries. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, that was the man. That, that, was, that was the man. That was the man that God said would, would meet you there. That's right. And he he didn't know because he's, he's hearing from God too. And, yeah. and so God said, well, go pick up this man. He's <laughs> going, why? Because yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of figuring it's kind of like Ananias. He's just now getting into the game. You know, This has been going on, on out the Damascus Road for a while. Now, but Ananias is just now hearing about it. I think he was kind of that way, too. He's just now, he's just now okay, God's just speaking to him now. Yeah. Is that he's part of this plan. Yeah. But uh, evidently God was. Because, I mean, people who don't know about just following the Lord <laughs> – understand people like you <laughs> now, of course uh, I've done crazy things before just because I just felt like it was just God yeah but not everybody understands that <laughs> right right <laughs> and I think I I think I said this before the last time you were here I had a some people on the radio radio sitting here there's there a whole family of them tell me this wild wild story and they ended up here in Tallahassee Living at the uh, uh, Walmart, which is what they call the Small Mart out in Lake Jackson, mm-hmm. for two years in a van <laughs> because they've God just told them to do it. So, wow! And so I've, I've I've heard these type of stories before, and I've participated in a few of these crazy things like this. But then again, 
the Bible talks about people like that. They okay. just, just hear from God. They just launch out. They do what God tells them to do. God usually has a plan. And obviously he has in your life because we just figured out it's been almost nine years. Mm-hmm. And now there's a ministry established that's in Africa and, and here in America, too. Because you're, you're here doing doing things. And I guess we should tell the radio audience that you're from Tallahassee. Yep. Or so so you, when you came to Christ, that happened right here yes. in, in the capital city. And then of all the places that you could have gone when you came back to America, God said, no, go home. Yep. Go home. And so you're, I guess you, you're in and out from Tallahassee. Yes, That's kind of, kind of your, kind of your headquarters. And, uh, now are you launching out here in America? Are you in other cities? What's going on there? So here in America, uh, we're doing things here too. Um, the goal, well, what are we doing here? What are we doing? Are you in, are you in other cities? We are, no, no, we're not. Currently just here. Working here in Tallahassee. Uh-huh. Okay. Now the last time, that you were here on the show, yeah, and you had had a, a young lady with you. Tell us her name again, Mar- 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 Marlita. Marlita, Marlita, yeah. and I've met Marlita. We've we've she, actually actually she's been on the show with another guest, yeah. before. Yeah. So so I knew her. Um, but you all had an event plan, yep, and that was at the moon, yep, and uh, prayer at the moon, yeah, and I think it was when we aired the show. I think it was going to be that same day that we, we aired it because we, we always pre record. Mm-hmm. So I think that the, the day that that show aired was the day of the event. I think so. And I had every intention of coming and something came up and I did not. And I had not heard anything about it until you came back here and sitting in the studio. The first question I asked you, how did that go? Uh, it was amazing. So that's what that's been about six months ago, maybe. Uh-huh. Okay. About that. Okay. What happened? Well, we. First, we met in a bar, okay, which was amazing. Um, we that, had the bo- bar at the moon, and the bar at the moon. Okay, yeah, the moon is a nightclub. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of pushback. Well, well not a lot. We had some pushback. The way A and P store. I remember it very yeah. well. <laughs> but it was just beautiful. We had about f- roughly four hundred. I don't remember the exact number. Which my, is amazing. My team yeah. would. Uh, the rest of our team would. Tell me the number or probably be upset that I'm not giving you the exact number, but it was roughly 400 uh, people in attendance. And we had believers, Christians from multiple denominations that normally disagree with each other greatly. And yet they were all gathered together. And at multiple points during the night, they were breaking out in groups, holding hands, praying with each other for the city, for the nation, for the lost for gang members, praying for drug addicts, praying for prostitutes to be saved, praying for violence to end, praying for unity in the body of Christ. We had Baptists, Catholics, Pentecostals, Charismatics, non-denom, Anglicans, all gathered under one roof. It was, it's amazing. It, was it was amazing. It is amazing. I rarely see that kind of unity. But uh, what type of promotion did you do in order to draw that such a very group of people we called a lot of people uh-huh. we called a lot of churches uh-huh. as many as we could get numbers for we called invited them asked them to invite their congregations we did but, shows but, like but, yours but do you know how that normally goes i do i mean i've been involved in this type of thing for a long long time yeah and and i just i know just how difficult it is to get something like that together yes and uh when you tell me 400 people of denominations all across the city, that's nothing short of a miracle. Agreed. It is. I mean, like, Agreed. Say, like I say, you're talking to somebody who, who, who knows. I know. <laughs> now, I mean, I do this radio show every week. Uh-huh. Now, sometimes I have guests, sometimes I don't. But just, just that task of finding people to come be on the radio show, um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got my experiences. And some people, they want to know everything there is to know about me. Yeah. And I tell them, I say, look, the show's not going to be about me. It's going to be about you. <laughs> because I tell people, and people ask me, well, what are we going to talk about? I said, we're going to talk about your passion. Mm. Whatever your passion is for ministry, that's a, that's our topic for the day. But yeah. but still, people are very, very suspicious a lot of times. 
Uh-huh. But, uh, and then they want to know, well, what denomination are you? I said, it doesn't matter what denomination I am. I, I believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, my Lord and Savior. Because you know? if I told you the name of the denomination I'm with, you, you've never heard of it anyway. <laughs> so, but but well, I said, what what happened there? Uh-huh. That's really phenomenal. It really uh-huh. is. And uh, so you you told me a little bit about it before we started the show. So tell me how, how the format kind of went. So the format was uh, because we understood they were going to be Christians from multiple streams of Christianity with different understandings of how to pray, uh, different levels of experience in right. praying. Some of them may right. be old believers, you new believers. Yeah. And, and, and let me just interject. Yeah. Tell, them, tell them about the agreement. Oh, the agreement, right. Yeah. So uh, we had different formats for prayer, but for those who would be on the stage with a microphone, they were required to sign a statement of faith on some basics that most Christians should be able to mm-hmm. agree upon. Right. Um, the essential, right. essentials of the Christian faith. And uh, if those, if they signed off, then they could speak from the microphone. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you had all these different denominations and different things, and they agreed to. to uh, yes. <laughs> we had <laughs> Anglicans, Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatic, non denominational. And Catholic priests sign the statement of faith. That's amazing. I double checked and triple checked everyone because I was shocked that <laughs> right. so many people came yeah. together yeah. in agreement. Yeah. yeah. And so, so uh, general atmosphere. What was it like? Oh. Peaceful. Yeah. yeah. Peaceful. Remember, remember, one of us is going to have to talk here. Yeah. <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, you're catching me with some. Good I know. Questions. I know. Peaceful. I think yeah. is the best way I could describe it. Wow. Um, how beautiful and how beautiful it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Wow. That's what it felt like. Yeah. It was amazing. Oh. Yeah. Nothing short, as you said, nothing short of a miracle. How long did it last? Uh, two hours. Two hours. Mm-hmm. And now was it just all prayer? Mostly prayer. Okay. Nobody, Mostly prayer the whole time. Prayer, we mixed in some worship in between. But there, there was, was no speaker, no no featured speaker. There was no featured speaker. You, did you have a, a, a musicians, there, I guess? So we had musicians. I think the thing that everyone loved the most was that we intentionally, and I let the pastors know ahead of the time about this, and gave a plug beforehand to let everyone know we don't want to dishonor anyone, but during our the event, we were intentional to not mention a single person's name. Really? Nor their ministry. No ministry. Really? Not a single ministry's name was mentioned, and I'm, no person's. I, I'm glad you just told us, because I just made an assumption here. And no person's name was mentioned. No titles were mentioned. The only name that was mentioned that night was Jesus. Wow. We invited pastors up and did not introduce who they were or where they were from or what church. They just came up. They led a prayer for about a minute or so. I would take the mic back, mic back and instruct the believers in the congregation to Grab a partner if you're comfortable, and we're going to take a few minutes, and you, all of us, are going to pray together for the gang members in Tallahassee to be saved. Or now we're going to take a few minutes to pray that there's reconciliation among the churches. Wow. But not a single person's name was mentioned. But now, were there prayer topics aside? There were topics. So, so, so in other words, when this person come to the microphone to Pray. They understood they had a topic to pray, and and you had given them a piece of paper or something. Mm-hmm. So so you would you just hand it to them as they come up. I let the pastors know ahead of time. Okay, this is the topic you'll be praying on. Okay, you're going to lead everyone in a prayer on this topic that they can amen your prayer, right? And then we will break into a time for them to pray individually or in groups. And that's the way the whole format. That's went the, the whole, whole way the whole, whole format went. So basically, somebody would. Uh, somebody who would be, you might say, a minister, a minister yeah. of some sort. Uh-huh. They knew what their, their topic is. They're coming up to the platform. They're praying for a minute or two. Yep. And then they're stepping down, and then you've got a, a time of corporate prayer over the same topic. Correct. And and I made topics were there. So we went through. Uh, I mixed two formats together. There's a passage uh, where Jesus says, "Go into." Jerusalem, Judea, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right. Uh, we took that format to mean we will pray for our individual lives, then our area, Tallahassee, then Samaria, the people we don't want to talk to, the right. people we would normally avoid, <laughs> right, right. which is why we prayed for gang members and prostitutes and people that the good, nice, good, clean people might not want to go around. Right. We wanted to pray for them. 
and then we prayed for the whole country. And um, uh, we followed a format uh, called uh, Acts. So the goal was off of Second Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, heal their land. So we realized we need to gather believers. We need to be in repentance. We need to pray. And it can't just be the leaders. It needs to be my people, right, all of my right, people. Right, right. So how do you get believers from different cultures, different backgrounds, different styles of prayer, and some of them different knowledge levels of how to pray? Some of them may have no idea how to pray. How do you bring them into one room, get them on the one accord, and also use that time to teach them how to pray? Sure. Because some have no idea how to pray. So, we followed a format of using uh, liturgy, leader-led prayer, and also individual prayer and group prayer, two or three. Okay. And so, we followed a, uh, an acronym called ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Okay. Meaning worship, confession, repentance, then thanksgiving, thanking the Lord, then supplication. Okay. Then we began asking Him to do things. But of the liturgy… Mm -hmm. Who did that? Oh, man, that was beautiful. So the liturgy, uh, eventually we phased out the liturgy. We began with liturgy because it's the easiest. It has the lowest bar uh, barrier to entry to learn how to pray. You okay. can just read off a page. Okay. And so for adoration, we began with a liturgy of adoration where one of our leaders would read a portion and then the audience would Read right, a response. Right, arrested, uh, so that was led by yeah. um, Bill Krisner, Father Bill Krisner, who is a Anglican priest, Anglican pastor at St. Peter's. Okay. And then uh, after that, or along with him, we had a local Catholic priest, uh, Father Tom, I believe. Um, he'll forgive me. I hope that I can't remember. <laughs> but like I said, we didn't. We never right. mentioned anyone's so even, names. Even when they were doing the liturgy, they no one knew name. who they were. No yeah. one knew who yeah. they were. Yeah. But I th I both think of that them, was really a good thing. The the two of them, yeah, led the liturgy together. They tag teamed the Catholic and the Protestant pastor. Wow, tag teamed, leading adoration to Jesus. Wow, so so it that was beautiful. One would read, then the congregation would read, and then the other would read. Uh, correct. Huh. That's that's really good. It was amazing. The, the Lord just gave this to you, didn't He? How, yeah. how, how to lay this thing out? Yes, it had to be because it's inspiring. Just hearing what you're what you're telling us here. Now, what about attire? What, what were were the different? Were the different like a, the Catholic and the uh, was anybody wearing anything that would identify mm -hmm. them to as to who they were? The Anglican and the Catholic were okay. They were wearing their. Uniforms, okay, and the collar, and the collar. Okay, so uh -huh. okay, okay, and, and that's an interesting thing, you know. Uh, people say, "Well, should should Protestants wear the collar?" Sure, and that's, that's a little bit of a controversy. Yeah, and I know even in our organization, some of the, in some of the bigger cities, some of our pastors will wear a collar going to some of the big hospitals. Okay, okay, but <laughs> one of our pastors, uh -huh. this has been years ago, he got convicted to wear one. Now, wow. we're Protestant. We're very, very Protestant. Sure. <laughs> okay. Sure. And uh, we read in a, a, a pastor's uh, church growth seminar mm -hmm. in, in uh, Unicoi, Georgia. I remember okay. this. And uh, we had about 35 pastors in a line going up to, to the, the chow hall to, to get food. And so I just walked up to this brother. And I said, brother, I'm just curious. I said, well, why, why are you wearing a collar? And mm -hmm. so, this is what he did. He said, now, you see those people sitting over there eating? They were not part of our group. Yeah. He says, now, how many ministers do they see? Huh. We've got a line of 35 pastors. He said, now, how many do they see? Huh. And he said, well, you. <laughs> because you're the only one that, is a, that has an identity I had right. As pastor, so he said, "Well, there's your point right there." <laughs> and I thought he made a good point sure. that that it's the visibility yeah. of of the of the clergy in the community. My it's, Anglican friends have made yeah, the same. Yeah, and, and you said just like this, like somebody's out there and they, and they're in trouble some way or another, and there's mm -hmm. a plain clothes policeman over here, and here's one in a uniform. Who are they going to go to? The uniform, <laughs> yeah, of course, because they, they know that's that's the, the yep. identity, of course. So so in other words. 
in the crowd yeah. of, among the congregation. Yes. They, they knew there were two pastors there. Correct. Even though there were many, many more. Correct. And I don't know what that has to do with anything, <laughs> but I just thought I'd point it out. Yeah. So. I think the beautiful thing was they recognized that these two were a Protestant priest and a Catholic priest. And they were there. And they were together. Yeah. And Working leading together. together. <laughs> oh, man. If, know, the, and if the night had ended right after they spoke. Yeah. It would have been a success to you me. Know, Beautiful. You know, we're going to do that in heaven. Amen. <laughs> every tribe, yeah. every tongue. Yeah. It's, in heaven, it's not going to matter anymore. Amen. But uh, no, I, it just sounds to me like it was an incredible time, and I'm sorry I missed it. And, That's okay. Uh, maybe the next time you do it. There's another one on April 7th. Okay. Same place. Okay. I'm going to write it on my little note right here. Planning April. to, We're planning to do it roughly every six months. Do you know what time of day that will be? I will get back to you on that. Maybe we can do a radio plug shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that one. April 7th, at the moon. At the moon. And uh, for those of you who... That is a Sunday afternoon. The moon is on Lafayette Street. So Mm -hmm. it's on the corner of Lafayette and Seminole. Yep. I know it very, very well. I go by there all the time. And like I said, I used to go by there and buy pudding to take home for my wife to fix me some pudding. <laughs> I remember that seven, when it was a A&P store many, many years. This is the uh, Gospel on the Radio talk show. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We've been talking, and I forgot to tell the folks who we are, but uh, hopefully people have kind of caught on by now. We've been here on 94.1, getting close to a year, maybe more. I mean, even though this is show number 1,159, I've been on four different radio stations over the years of doing this broadcast. And, uh, and of course, recently, 97.9 that I was on for years, they changed formats. And so Brother Doug invited me to come over here to 94.1 because I was already doing the sing and the uh, daily broadcast. Anyway, you know Pastor King, he likes gospel music. So we're going to play a little music for you, and then we'll get back to Brother Sean. This is the, well, the sun's gonna come quartet. up in the morning and the joy of the Lord's gonna rise with the dawn and the sun's gonna come up in the morning. Yep, it will. And the thing that I have discovered that uh, when the scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did yesterday, he can do it again today. It's a... Uh, and I just love to hear songs that are positive. And to me, that is one. So that's LaFever Quartet. The sun's going to come up in the morning. And this is the Gospel on the Radio talk show. I'm Pastor Jack King. I am your host. I get to do this every Sunday morning and just enjoy it immensely. Brother Sean Kane is my guest today from uh, Evangelism Global. And, uh, but also, I want to let you know that you can find this show on the podcast if you want to find it. You just type in Pastor Jack King, Tallahassee, and it'll come up, and there's all kinds of content there for you. A lot of the talk shows and the daily broadcast that airs here on 94.1 at 11 o'clock, and then it goes on the podcast. It goes all over the world. That and also on Praise Radio. So if you want to like maybe a little, little something to kind of get your day going. It's only about four minutes. And I just take the scripture and just let the scripture speak. And I believe it'll be a blessing to you. And also the Saturday Night Gospel Sings, 7 o'clock every Saturday night here on 94.1, a full hour of, as I say, the best music on the planet, Southern Gospel style. So I invite you to do all that. Also, I'm the pastor of Freedom Road Christian Ministry, 720 Capital Circle Northeast, and we'd love to have you come worship with us. On Sunday morning, 11.05 is our start time, frcm.us. That's the web address. You can check us out there. Now, Brother Sean, uh, you just got back from Uganda. Mm -hmm. And uh, so did you, I think you said this, you had kind of a crusade type of thing while you were there. Now, how does that work? Do you rent a stadium or something, or where where do you have this at? So we have our own, uh, mostly our own equipment. Uh-huh. Um, well, not mostly. We do have our own equipment. We have a stage, uh, sound equipment, full sound equipment, concert sound equipment, um, generator. And so we set up anywhere. Okay. All we need is a big enough space to host people. So how did you get permission to do that? Are you just kinda- so one of our friends has a church in the poorest slum in Uganda. Okay. And so on his property, 
there's just enough space for us to put that stage. And so we set the stage up with our sound there in the slums. Okay. And you have a generator. And we have a generator. Because I know in uh, Ghana, <laughs> they just... You can't rely on the electricity. Yeah, they just climb grid. up They climb up the pole. And they had these clips, and so they just clip it on. <laughs> oh, man. I said, yeah, somebody's got to get electrocuted down there. <laughs> but that's what they do. And then they, yeah. they run their PA systems off of it. Oh, wow. And, uh, uh, of course, I when we were there, in the, we were in Kamasi. was okay. the name of the city I was in. And they had a big soccer tournament on it. They, I said, well, you know, when they turned those lights on, on those soccer tournaments, it just sucked all the power. Because <laughs> everybody had to turn the refrigerators off and everything. Uh-huh. But then again, uh, it's a different life it is. In, in Africa. It's just a different world. It is. But it's amazing how quickly you will adapt to it. Yep. And I remember a, if guy, you're willing. Well, a guy told me before I went on the first mission thing, he says, Keep a journal because he said you'll be amazed at, at how quickly this stuff is not unusual to you anymore. Mm. You know, you're seeing people walking around with sewing machines on top of their head and uh-huh. that type of, type of thing. You just kind of get used to it after a while. Yeah. And you just yeah. get, you to come back in America and that seems strange to you. When hey, you that's back. right. <laughs> so still seems strange to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there the first time you went. How long did you? About six months, wasn't it? About six months. And, and uh, during that time, uh, I mean, God just put you right where he wanted you yep. with, with the, uh, the gentleman who yes. met you there. And he was a, he was a pastor. Uh-huh. And so you just became involved in his ministry. I became involved with his ministry. The next night, I still wasn't sure why I was there the first day. Right. Just, I'm here. The Lord said one day yeah. you'll go to Africa. And I'll do something with a field full of people hearing the gospel. I wasn't sure what that had to do with anything. So the second day I was there, he introduced me to his other pastor who leads their missions ministry. Uh-huh. Um, and they go all over East Africa holding large outdoor crusades. The ministry is called Africa Harvest Mission. And so that pastor is Pastor Stephen Sebiala. And I moved in with him the second night. I lived with him the rest of the six months. Really? Uh-huh. And so the Lord just exposed you to this whole world of outdoor evangelism. That's right. And it, it just God's just perfect timing. Perfect. And and he knew exactly what he was doing. That's right. Now, during he said, from the time that God told you to do this, it was seven days, right? Uh-huh. Something about that seven. Was there every time when you said, I'm just getting this wrong? No. I mean, did, did you wrestle with it? No. 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 Not at all. Uh, you know, and it wasn't in the dark. Oh. I was waiting I knew that one day I would go to Africa. I was waiting for the day God would say, okay, go. Yeah. So this didn't come out of nowhere, but the details obviously weren't there. Um, yeah. There was enough confirmation that it was the Lord telling me to go uh-huh. that there was so much confidence and such clarity that it was God asking me to go that the question was not whether I believed it was the Lord, but whether I was willing to obey. Yeah. But now what about visas and passports and all that sort of thing? Uh-huh. Did you already have a passport? I had a passport. What about the visa? Uh, I had a $50 bill for the visa. That's the only money I had. Someone <laughs> gave it to me as I got to the airport in Jacksonville. Now, you know, you know, are you talking about visa, like a visa card? <laughs> are you, are you, are you yeah. teasing me? It's, a, it's an immigration <laughs> stamp, a stamp from immigration, okay. which was also interesting. Normally, when you enter a country... Uh, and you're looking to get a visa, you have to right. give a lot of information. Uh-huh. Who you're staying with, the duration of your stay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. why you're there, right. someone who they can contact, a location they can you can be found. My immigration form was blank. It really? had my name on the top and blank. Really? They didn't even read it. Which, <laughs> they just glanced at it, stamped my passport, took the money and said, go. Really? That has never happened since. <laughs> not bad, <Yep>. not. <laughs> no. I, at least, yeah. At least not at that airport. It has right. happened since, just right. not at that particular airport. Because I remember when when I went to Ghana, that uh, they canceled our visa. Uh-huh. We were we were. I was in Chicago airport, ready to go, yeah. and then also we got the word they they've canceled our visas. That they they were having some political uh, uh, oh, okay. uh, unrest. Yeah. And so no, you can't go. And yeah. so so we had to go home. Uh, that was actually in 92, and I didn't actually go until 93. Wow. So I, I know something about, <laughs> you know, 
this is just a hand of God just walking you through this whole thing. And, and the thing about it is a lot of times when we are just really, really naive, that's when God does some of his best work. It is. <laughs> because we it gets don't us have, out of the way. Yeah, we don't have a clue. Just, uh-huh. And so and sometimes you, you don't even realize that you can even fail because you just don't know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what the whole thing about walking in faith is all about. And, exactly. uh, and, and it was – you mentioned a little while ago something about about the faith moving and the Booth Brothers is a singing group. They have a song that's called "Faith Keeps Walking," uh-huh. and it talks about that the, a lot of times when you see things, you see fear, and fear causes you to see uh, the storm. Whereas in faith, mm-hmm. you just you just keep on walking, and you don't see all of that, or that's you don't right. you don't let yourself be concerned about it. But that's right. faith. As the scripture tells us, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Correct. We want to see it, though, don't we? Correct. <laughs> but it's amazing. And that's why I wanted you to go back and tell the story again, because people that's who are just, just tuned in, they say, well, what are they, what are they talking about? Now you've heard yeah. the story. Now, Sean is here back in America. He goes back from time to time, and he's establishing ministry. Mm-hmm. What other things are going on here now? Yeah. So here, I'm working with other ministries to help disciple people. Okay. Um, how to follow the Lord, how to be a disciple of Jesus, um, how to follow the Lord and how to raise up others has been our main focus here. Uh, bringing the, people to Christ, but teaching others how to bring someone to Christ. Do you have a team here? A small team. A small team. Mm-hmm. And then these are made up of what? Mostly volunteers. Volunteers uh-huh. who have... They've met you. They feel good about what you're doing. They've, they've, they want to be a part. Correct. And that's, that's casting vision. That's right. And, and faith. It's just, you just say, well, okay, God, you'll bring people together to be a part of what I'm doing here. That's right. As, uh, as, as we go along. That's right. And, uh, a lot of times, the people who are going to be a part of your team, some of them, are, they're not even saved yet and they'll get saved under your ministry. Yeah. And then God, God will raise them up and God will use them. Yep. To do that, yeah. And uh, are, do you have a uh, a focus? You say more lean more to the young, old, youth, children. Where 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 where's your focus, or is yeah. there one? Uh, <laughs> there is a focus on the lost, but you mean discipling or people we're trying to reach? Yeah, I, I like to disciple anyone. I love discipling young people. Uh-huh. We've been really working. I've noticed the Lord having me working mostly with high school and college age okay. people. But the focus is I want to go to the darkest places that nobody else wants to go. Such as? Such as if you gave me the option of going to Killarn to share the gospel or going over to a gang headquarters and knocking on the door of a crack house, Uh take me to the second one. Really? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. You you don't have any fear as far as the circumstances and situations? If I'm already dead, what's there to be worried about? (laughs) You know, about dead as into if I'm dead uh, in Christ, right. my life is no longer my right, own. What, right. What's there to be worried about? Okay, now, so how is that going as far as the youth? Are you could, are you actually meeting young people that you're, you're able to discipleship with? Yes, and uh, tell us about it. Oh man, it's, it's amazing. Uh, some of them are part of random churches around town, uh-huh. some house churches. Others we've been partnering with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Yeah, and taking some and of that's their, how we initially uh-huh. got together. Was yeah, through that. Yeah, of course. So we take some of their student leaders and we take them out learning to share the gospel. We go through the gospels, asking questions like taking maybe one chapter a week, and the students being able to ask questions of what does it really mean to look for my life to look like Jesus is living it. Uh huh. And how is he calling me to do that? Okay. Uh, I find it confronts them with sometimes traditions or, or uh, you know, sometimes we love to compare ourselves to our pastor or our favorite preacher and say, I'm, I'm not too far off, but the, the high calling is to be like Christ. Uh-huh. And so I've been finding that it's led students, uh, one in particular, that I'll leave the person's name out, Last, uh, in the spring semester of 2023, changed this person's entire life. Huh. That was their testimony to me. Wow. That their entire life had changed. They had been not 
outwardly living for the Lord, but inwardly uh-huh. and behind closed doors were not. And then this person began to radically follow Jesus, even to the point of having friends, very close people in relationships, completely abandon them because they chose that they're going to start following Jesus because of their faith. wholeheartedly. Wow. wow. Yeah. Now, where do you meet with them at? <laughs> Wherever there are people who don't know Jesus. Uh-huh. So we'll meet sometimes um, at parks, yeah. at the campus, wherever we can find people. But are these uh, where you're expecting them to show up? I mean, are just random? You just meet somebody? Oh, so so we will uh, the ones that I'm discipling. Yeah, and we'll set a time for them to meet with me. We yeah. meet together. Sometimes it's just for us to pray, fast, learning to fast. We're right. going to share the gospel. But we'll set a time and a location and meet, and then we go where the Lord sends us. Uh-huh. You mentioned FCA. It, uh-huh. are, are you meeting people through FCA? Are, are you are you going to some of the huddles? Or I've gone to some of the huddles to speak. Yeah. Some yeah. of the huddles to speak. Yeah, but uh, our goal, even our ministry's goal, is less to be doing everything. I would prefer to be doing less of me doing the ministry. Uh-huh. The goal is really that to take some of these students that they would be at the huddles and leading the huddles and. So through your discipleship, working with yeah. them, encouraging them. Yeah. To, to I would rather see them leading Bible studies and bringing revival to their school than yeah. me. Than me. Yeah, yeah. Than me ever setting foot on their no, campus. No, that's a wonderful concept. I, I, I love that because yeah. that's exactly where, we're, where we need to be. As Amen. As far as that goes. It, it reminds, I just, there's a movie that came out, you called Facing the Giants. And that, that's that school. You, when the coach, they said the coach, you need to come see this. And he looks out there and there's all these kids out on the, on the campus and they're all sit, sitting around in circles and they've got their scriptures open. And, uh, I mean, that's what you want to see. What it, that's exactly. You know? And the thing about it is that for uh, young people to even to carry their Bible to school, that's, that takes some boldness. It does. But, Yet it's been done. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and they, do, they, do they still do the thing where they at the pole? I mean, yeah, they at the pole. They, they, the pole. Mm-hmm. Do they still do that because they do. Because that's that, again, that's a bold thing. I remember when I used to go with my son when he was teaching at Rod. I'd go to the to the huddles, uh-huh. and you'd see the the kids who were coming into to his classroom. To, but then there, there'd be other kids in, our, in the hall. They weren't coming to FCA, uh-huh. and I realized that these young people they're taking they're making a bold statement. Yeah. Come to this huddle yeah. or this this meeting before school. Yeah. And and uh, uh I, I was just I was amazed, but yeah. I applauded them. I said, Well, you guys are making a stand here. You're making a, a statement. And well, through your discipleship, you're able to build that boldness. That's right. Into to teach. That's right. Them. Okay. Maybe so, they'll go get some of those kids who are afraid to come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. To, I mean, not, not, don't be afraid of being different. Yeah. Be bold for Christ. I That's, was just thinking of the scripture earlier today. It was on a preview for a, the show, The Chosen, um, where Jesus says, Don't think that I've come to get, bring peace, but a sword, because I've come to make a, your enemy will be those of your own household. Yeah. Wow. Um, that. That should be the, even though it's a, a big fear, I think, for believers, it's part of following Christ that taking up our cross means, to be a Christian means, from the moment I say, yes, I believe yeah. in Jesus, I want to follow him, it means that you will, no questions asked, be rejected by some yeah. people. Yeah, he told us it would will be. be. He told us it wouldn't be an easy walk. That's right. And yeah, but he'll be with you. Because the thing about it is that you're talking about uh, teenagers, young people doing that type of thing, going to the FCA meeting. Right. I know adults that wouldn't do that. Right. And I mean, I know grown men who wouldn't take that bold statement. Yeah. To to lead their family in such such a way. Uh, one of the things uh, I was just came back from a men's conference that I put together, and I encouraged the men. I says, "Pray with your wives." Mm. And I, and I know men who. They're, they can't even do that. Yeah. I'm saying, if you can't pray with this woman that you're, 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 I mean, your whole life is involved with it, then there's something wrong here. Yeah. But yet I, I would have men just look at me like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going, that's just, as a scripture, that would be your reasonable service. That's reasonable but service. But yet it's difficult for people sometimes. So, so I mean, 
I'm sure you're probably discipling some adults as well. I am. <laughs> and you're, I am. you're. So is that a good part of your day? That, that That's the majority. Okay. So, yeah. so you, you're spending time, you're making appointments with people. So I'm going to come by, I'm going to meet you. We're going we're gonna to spend some time. Sometimes I just grab some of those kids and take them to the grocery store with me. And do what? Just go- this, this is what normal life looks like. We're in a grocery store. <laughs> What does it look like to be a Christian in a, in a grocery store? In a grocery store, okay. Maybe we end up getting in a gospel conversation with somebody in the line or praying for our cashier. Uh-huh. People learn only 5% of what they hear. Wow. So unfortunately, the sermon is just ineffective, uh-huh. very ineffective at making disciples. Jesus' way of making disciples was hands-on. Uh-huh. If you want to be a disciple of mine, come and follow me. Right, right. Come and follow me. But well, he did sermons too. He did sermons, <laughs> but his sermons were rare. Uh-huh. His sermons were rare, and his way of teaching was hands-on. Yeah, well, seventy percent. Someone remembers seventy percent of what they do hands-on. Well, I'm I'm, I'm aware, and I'm one of those. Yeah, uh, just a lot of times when I I hear a sermon, I'm asking about now what did I get here? And that, that may be a few highlights, right? But I'm sure I didn't get the whole thing. So I agree with your point. Sure, but I also know this is that. If we don't come to a place in our own society uh-huh. that we're willing to make those bold statements, we're going to see the unfortunately the Christian faith continue to decline. Of course, and, right. the, and the whole th- we, when we pray for a re- revival, yeah, we're we're actually just saying, Lord, bring that boldness back, Amen, to to the to church to Christians that we're not a. As, as the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. And I'll preach it and proclaim it wherever I go. Amen. And, uh, That's the power of God to salvation, everyone who believes. Yeah, yeah. Well, but Brother Sean, you're always uh, fascinating to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I appreciate you are that you are willing to come and be on the show with me. I don't, I don't, I don't have to twist your arm. You always, no. As long as you're in the country. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> but we always do close the broadcast out with prayer. And uh, Father God, I'm just asking that, uh, Lord, you just bless this man, that you'll just bless his work and, and the, the calling that you've laid upon his heart, his the willingness to go and discipleship and do what you ask him to do, Father God. I just pray, Lord, that your blessings would just flow through him. Many hearts and many lives will be changed and people will come to faith. And Lord, we give you the glory and the praise. And Father, we do pray over all of our pastors here in our city. We pray over our churches. We pray, Father God, that there would be peace. There would be peace in this world, peace in America. Father God, help us, Lord, as we're in this season of election. God, you help us, Father, I pray. And Lord, we do pray for peace in the city of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in Israel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Sean Kane from uh, Global Evangelism Global. Evangelism Global. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and being on the broadcast. And uh, till next Sunday morning, may the Lord bless you.